Are you dreaming of getting away with your partner where you can rest, play, and learn more about your relationship? Join us for the Allender Center's Marriage Enrichment Retreat, May 13th through 15th, 2022. This retreat is intentionally small, limited to 40 couples, and located in a beautiful setting at Cedarbrook Lodge just outside of Seattle, Washington. You'll experience live, personalized teaching from Dr. Dan and Becky Allender, along with the founders of Reconnect Institute, Dr. Steve and Lisa Call. This weekend is designed to foster conversations that will offer connection and replenishment to your marriage. This is our most popular marriage enrichment offering and always fills up quickly. To reserve your spot today, visit theallendercenter.org slash marriage. Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. Well, I don't know if there's anything more delightful uh, than being with my wife on a podcast, but in this case, nothing more delightful than having dear, dear friends and colleagues, Dr. Steve Call and his beloved, gorgeous wife, Lisa. Folks, thank you for joining us talking about a trauma-informed marriage. Now, let, let me just start with this. Certainly, there are couples who know that they bear significant trauma from the past that plays out to some degree in the context of their marriage. And this podcast is for you. Here's the dilemma. I don't think anybody can live in a fallen world and not know some degree of trauma, whether it's capital T, significant violations of human dignity trauma, or whether it's just the daily outrageous arrows and misfortune. The fact is, we all know trauma. So if you're married, you need to have a trauma-informed marriage. So welcome, Becky. Welcome, Lisa. Welcome, Steve. Uh, thank, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Dan and Becky. Fun. So fun to be with you and so looking forward to our conversation together, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, what a beginning. This right? really... I, what a setup. <laughs> I, I, I honestly thought uh, this would be a little harder for us to like find a significant trauma moment uh, that we could talk about as an illustration. And of course, yesterday, um, Becky and I had a, a less than pleasant uh, interaction, would you With not? not even thinking about a podcast. Oh, I wasn't even thinking about a <laughs> See, podcast. See, the Lord provides. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't put it as Jehovah Jireh in this case, but uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, there was some sense uh, of clearly provision. But really what we want to say is that uh, in, in doing any kind of good work, therapeutically, any kind of work where you're dealing with the heart of the other. We've got to deal with four major categories that we're going to walk through. The first is you got to know your triggers mm -hmm. because all trauma provides a context where uh, usually unwittingly we get triggered by an event happening in the present, but the real energy behind it is events or traumas that are often related to our family of origin or significant past traumas. So we need to know triggers, but we're going to talk as well about a category of reenactment, which is another way of saying all of us have stylistic, unique ways of managing the trauma of the present mm. from the trauma of the past. Mm -hmm. And so we need to know how we attempt to manage often exacerbates and intensifies the struggle between, at least between the two of us. And then we're going to begin to move into what has to occur if there's going to actually be change. And we're going to talk about that principle of dealing with the log in your own eye. But in that, we want to conclude with the reality that there has to be a movement of blessing. So four categories, triggers, reenactment, log in your own eye and the lovely category of blessing. So mm. I, I don't know, should, should we jump into 
uh, our marital mess. Sure. I, I think before that, just real quick, I would say that what, what you just have offered, I think for many of us and many of those listening, uh, it's very courageous of them to stay present to this conversation because I think part of where we can already be triggered is never mind. I, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to talk about that. Uh, you know, that's, like, how is that helpful? And I think the, the last category of what you named is so helpful because it's a reminder that we are called and invited to bless the other in the midst of their own trauma response and, and the reenactment pattern. But I think the invitation around kindness is so essential and so important in this conversation is that we remember that we are for one another in the midst of conversations like this. Because I think for many people listening, again, that temptation is, oh man, I don't, I don't know if I want to go there. I don't know if I, I, I want to be intentional about remembering how our trauma stories and narratives impact our, our marriage relationship. So I think it's really courageous to have this conversation together. And for those of listening, I think for them to stay present to it as well. Oh, it's so wise to put it that way. The fact is, so much of us wants to just sort of apologize mm -hmm. at, at best. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry, I blew it. Okay, yeah. can we just get on? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that may be helpful and maybe enough, mm -hmm. but at least not the kind of encounter Becky and I had yesterday. Uh, that would not have been sufficient. Mm -hmm. I was also going to say, um, those people that are maybe listening going, oh, I don't think this applies to me. Uh, cause I was one of those people about 15 years ago and I was listening to you, Dan, at a marriage conference and I thought, oh yeah, I, you know, I don't really have trauma. I don't really have shame. And it was so impactful. Like when I began to listen. So I think maybe people don't even recognize mm -hmm. that this is what's happening or what's going on or aren't able to name it. So I want those people to stay listening too, because I, we, we may not think this applies, but it really, I don't know really a person it, it's not going to apply to. Yeah. Well, let, let, let me just set the context. Um, I, I needed to help Becky get a W-2 form for her, which required going into an Amazon dark hole labyrinth with minotaurs uh, and <laughs> monsters. Uh, and, and it is uh, every year that I have to do this. I hate it. I think they design it so that there are, um, well, folks who will see marriage counselors. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I hate it, too, because I, it's never been easy. So I think we've had to do this uh, for four years. Yeah, four years. And, it's, and I have to, like, say ahead of time, hey, I think I need a little time with you. Uh, Maybe, like, Sunday we could look at this. I think I need some help. Right. But I have to die, cl say that 10 times over maybe 10 days. So, and then finally, there's a bit of time. Well, I keep hoping that Jesus will return. <laughs> <laughs> Before you have to go down the dark exactly. hole of finding the W-2. Yeah. And I'll say that, you know, trying to go into websites and get something done where it's, you know, you're given directions like just do this, this and this. It never works for me or maybe it works for others. But anyway, we entered into trying to find uh, her W-2 information and the directions didn't work and they didn't work. And we did it two or three times, and I was getting frustrated, not with her, and and in some sense, just at the process. And I sort of said, I, I need to stop. And she was like, no, no, why don't you try this? Because maybe we should try. So we kept going and kept going. And it got to a point where, and I'll just say it in simple terms. I was so frustrated and so angry, my voice getting louder, like, that's not going to work. We've done this two or three times. Why would you think it's going to help another time? Well, and then we get the code, right, to check with your phone. And then we realize it's not my right phone number, so we're not getting the code. So, I mean, everything oh. should say, put it away. But I'm like, maybe we'll not get to it. Let's let's keep working. So everything so, says pause. Is that oh, fair to I'm, say? I'm, Every I'm literally saying we need to stop. And and yet mm -hmm. in in choosing to keep going, mm -hmm. it's my choice to keep going, but I'm blaming her for the necessity to keep going. And the mm -hmm. tensions between the two of us just got to a point where we were we were mm -hmm. oh, just full of 
Well, I was then full finally of it worked though, right? Well, this is well after the rest okay. of the story. But so she got up at one point and I could just tell she was um, uh, sick of me. And not only that, but deeply <laughs> hurt uh, and had like shut down. And I, I don't know how to say it better then. I'm, I'm not thinking about this podcast, but all I know is it is clear I have hurt my wife. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got up and went over and it, 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 things began at least a little bit to change. Oh, I don't even remember it that way. You know, I think that's part of when you're in something that's so primal. So triggering. I thought that you were gone for a while. I thought we finally we finally did get the form. You did. But then it, it was just so costly. And mm -hmm. then I remember you coming and your eyes were kind. And mm -hmm. you said, I'm sorry, I hurt you, didn't I? And then I couldn't even talk. Mm -hmm. I couldn't talk. I couldn't move. And actually, the, it was so hard. It lasted the whole day. But we did hug. You were so kind. I didn't want to cry. I don't cry very often. But I felt so stupid. And, mm. and that it, it took us a while to understand that this was coming from my childhood. Yeah. Where I've been told so often, dumb, dumb Dora, dumb, dumb Dora. Mm. You're stupid. You're stupid. But when you're in it, you don't know that. You mm -hmm. don't know that you're at such a young place and you're so vulnerable. So mm -hmm. his eyes were so, mm -hmm. so kind. But it took us, it, I mean, it lingered the whole day. And I think that's the tension of what you both are naming is that when reenactment collides with the other's reenactment, like we're both remembering, we're both being triggered, and now what? And I think that's the one of the most difficult moments in marriage is when our trauma triggers collide with one another, literally. What you're just naming, like Dan, yeah. your own trauma, shame around not being able to figure something out. What's wrong with me? You know? And then for you, Becky, too, the same, like, it's not okay to need. It's not okay to ask for help. It's not, what's wrong with me that I can't figure it out on my own? Yeah. And, yeah. and Dan just gets more intense and louder, mm -hmm. which is normal and so uh, I mean normal from my family of origin and that doesn't happen as much but as an early married couple we didn't understand triggers and reenactment we just were in it you know so you would I mean we just <laughs> it's our 45th wedding anniversary weekend but we were taken I mean we just knew like okay we need to walk we need to move our bodies because we couldn't regulate ourselves. We needed the other. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, 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 this will seem maybe preposterous, but what we're going to accomplish uh, in, in a conference that the calls and the Islanders will do in May, the outline that we're trying to engage now actually came back. Like, oh my gosh, we've both been triggered. Yes. Oh no! We're we're simply structurally reenacting what we've both done to try and deal with past trauma with ourselves and others. Mm -hmm. So I, as crazy again as it may sound, it was really helpful to have this material somewhere in me, even though it certainly wasn't there in the beginning mm -hmm. of the process, mm -hmm. to be able to go. You've been triggered by what? And then for her to ask the same question, you, I know I triggered you. Mm -hmm. what? what? And and I think that was part of the beginning of the walk was being able to say, I, I felt you, you brought me to a point where I felt so stupid. And I was able to say, not, not condemning that and bringing my own, but saying, and I felt so futile. So mm -hmm. between my futility and your feeling stupid, we were both beginning that reenactment of you freezing in the presence of very angry parents and me just getting louder, louder. and mm. intense, uh, you know, with a complex uh, family full of mental illness. Mm -hmm. what's, so, the hope, what's the hope of getting louder, would you say? 
Well, uh, either the person will quit asking uh, of me anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, by in one sense, potentially exploding with some drizzle of explosion already. Yeah. yeah. It, it kind of like warns everybody. Hmm. It, it like leave leave me alone. Leave me alone yeah. and take responsibility. You be the one at fault. Mm. And that, uh, uh, you know, was, I mean, it used to work. And thankfully, because of, of maturing on both our parts, that doesn't work quite in the way mm -hmm. that it used to. And, and I think also what you named, which is very, very hopeful, is that perhaps the duration of being triggered is less over time. The intensity is still there, but what you named is not the, the duration of distance is less. The return maybe is a little bit sooner. Like Dan, your awareness, like to be able to say, I, I have harmed my wife and the return. Like Becky, you said he was able to return, mm -hmm. but, but it's still difficult to receive that return when we've been maybe so wounded by the other. Yeah, and I think even my body didn't allow it to be all okay. You know, I couldn't just, oh, thanks, and I'm glad this is over. Yeah, yeah. You know, it took mm -hmm. hours of, not that we had to talk all the time, but it was uh, just mm -hmm. a, a sense of, wow, that was so hard. So hard and yeah. My body feels still not well. Well, and it was it, it was your idea to walk. Oh, we I knew I we needed to get out of the house. It, so it we need to walk, not body. just. Yeah, we needed mm -hmm. to move our bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a way to recover. Mm -hmm. In hopes yeah. of recovery. Mm -hmm. Was there a, We were friends by then. Was mm -hmm. there a temptation of, I need to walk, I'm out of here, mm -hmm. I'm going to move my body, or or do you feel like you have that, there was a connection made so that it was, we, I'm going to call we, this one for us. Yes, that was it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. As that's, that's a big part of each of our days together is walking. Mm -hmm. And I think for both of us, it was the beginning of looking, even though I was clearly, uh, if one has to put words to the offender and the offended, I, I clearly was far more the offender. But I think there was something about Becky being able to name something of what was happening for her in freezing and making that connection to her own story with her parents, mm. it just allowed me to rest and go, yeah, we're both in this. You know, yeah. I, I'm, I clearly mishandled it. Her freezing, a, a normal trauma response, allowed her to begin to name something of the nature of what happens between us when I get intense and she freezes. But you know what? I couldn't have named it without your kind eyes. Yeah. You did return to the room. You did come and seek me out, which I didn't want because I I knew I would cry and I would feel foolish. Mm -hmm. You know, it was not like what I wanted to have mm -hmm. to go through. But without having gone through that, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have moved forward. Without the return. Without yeah. Dan's return, without the yeah. other's return. Like yeah. that, that is so essential yeah. to any kind of repair. Yeah. yeah. And so when you got up, that was maybe hiding. Were you hiding? I, I probably was frozen yeah. by the laundry room. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you came back to the kitchen. And yeah, it's really hard to cry when you're feeling so. So foolish. triggered. Yeah. Yeah. Triggered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it is the kindness. Like it. I mean, that's been such a theme in so many different conversations, but it is the kindness that allows you to maybe receive and that, that, but that's intentional, right? Dan, that, like, that's not just an automatic, oh, I need to go be kind. Like I need to own the part I played in the harm that I just caused my spouse. Like that, that takes a tremendous amount of integrity, I think, for us, for any of us to be aware of, wait a minute, I, I, I wasn't kind in the way I spoke to you, the way I acted towards you. Yeah, I'm not sure I can do this well, but let me see if I can try. Yeah. There was something, I mean, I was so clear in my own heart how, in some sense, wicked I had yeah. been in how I had engaged her. Hmm. But there was something as well in naming, oh my gosh, you have felt so foolish and futile for not being able to figure out something that any human being on the earth who can read and has an eighth grade education should be able to get onto this website and do it. 
And then to be able to step back and go, oh my gosh, what is the violent contempt you're holding for yourself? Mm -hmm. And then being able to go, oh, back to this word trigger, and then back to the fact of you've always had to deal with a problem by getting intense and getting loud. Mm -hmm. Oh, and again, I, I, I don't know if folks believe us that we can be this foolish and this blind, but the fact is, I know I am. Mm -hmm. And But yet to have that category there, to literally be able to go, oh my gosh, this is what we're going to cover in the marriage conference. Mm -hmm. This is what we're going to talk about uh, on a podcast. Literally like, oh, here it is. <laughs> here it is. And I also know there can be no movement toward the other if there's defensiveness, mm -hmm. if there's, you know, a, a kind of holding on to the judgment against the other. Mm -hmm. Instead, I mean, not that I felt like she had handled this perfectly, because at one level, I wish we had stopped. A lot earlier, and I couldn't. I was just determined. <laughs> so yeah. all, all that to say, I still bear the log. And even though it may sound like a burden or as a form of contempt, Actually, it's incredibly freeing to say, I can own my part. Mm -hmm. I don't know what she'll do with hers. I can own my part. And in that, there is the beginning of, of a kind of grief yes. that I think will set the context to eventually come to the ability to bless mm -hmm. the other mm -hmm. because you're allowing your own heart to bless your heartache, to bless the failure of engagement, not bless in the sense of condoning it, but being able to say, I have a, a growing tenderness to my own heart's failure, and therefore I can enter more tenderly into the harm I've created for my wife. And then too, I think we're just kind of getting this to be able to do this with one another, to return with our own story. I'm learning more of his story. He knows more of my story. Yes. And then, you know, yeah, like we've, we should be better at this. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've been saying that for ourselves for like quite a few years. Like, wait, we've been married 35 years and how come we haven't figured this out yet? What What is, what, what's going on between us? I think one, one thing that just more to highlight is I think sometimes what is so hard and what you're talking about, Dan, is sometimes I think we justify in the moment our harm of the other because of the harm that we've endured. Mm -hmm. And and I think that is just such a part of the reenactment, part of the trauma triggers in those moments is I I'm and it's almost not even conscious. I I deserve to harm you because of what I've endured, because of the harm that I've endured. Is that in in those moments I think sometimes that's our only way to cope with the trauma that we've endured, the harm that we've endured, is we displace it. We want to place it. We want to project it. And we justify it in the moment. And then two minutes later, we just feel so terrible about what we've done. Yeah. Well, and for us, as Becky put it well, I think we came to a point, particularly on our walk, of just being able to care for one another, to explore something of what each of us felt, mm -hmm. what the triggers, the reenactment, something of the log in one another's eye. But I think what was more important was the ability in forgiveness. And there was forgiveness for each other, but primarily for my failure. The reality is forgiveness doesn't take away, in some sense, the cortisol rush, the stress biochemicals. The, in one sense, we were both flooded by all that occurred. And it didn't ruin, ruin the day, but it took a lot of work to just stay together, not requiring everything to be perfect mm -hmm. uh, as we would have both wanted. And even, even I, I don't think we'll actually admit what time we went to bed, yeah. but let's just say it was early. <laughs> by the end of the day, we were just, we, we could, we could barely concentrate on getting dinner and being able to just sort of put aside the dishes. Mm -hmm. That weariness that comes when there has been so much internal yeah. uh, tumult, mm -hmm. 
we still have to bless even that, to bless our bodies yes. in the middle of the kind of intensity that generally happens when there is that kind of failure. Yeah, and I think that was true for us this last week, what you just named is when we have those kind of maybe relational injuries, you know, like what we could call this reenactment or this trauma trigger, in a way we're wounded. We're relationally wounding or have been wounded by the other. And I think, Dan, what you just named is so essential is this time of recovery from from this relational injury in that in like what you talked about earlier in the day. I mean, I, I, I would say that was true for us this week. I don't know what it is about Sundays, but <laughs> yeah. for us, <laughs> Sundays that? seem to be the trigger day. I, I have no idea w- what the connection is to that, but there is something in something about Sundays, it, it, it's it's as if it opens the door to the possibility of either reenactment or being triggered, something happens. And uh, do you want to share part of what happened on Sunday? I guess there's more open time on Sundays or something. But, yeah. You want to look at- um, well, for, for us, I think it was a, a similar, like, explosive quality. But, um, yeah, it started off with a simple question. What? I, um, I think I made a bid and for some connection and all of a sudden we were in this heated argument that we'd been in many, many times before. And, um, let's just say it didn't go well. It didn't go well. It did not go well. We were driving on a familiar road well, th- and this a particular is later, time of the day. I think, yeah. I think we decided because we already had planning to go for a walk. So we were driving to our place where we we're going to walk and, but it was continuing in the car and there was this very heated discussion. Uh, if you call it a discussion. Um, it wasn't a discussion where there was a lot of loudness from yeah. him. I, mean, I, I think I resonate and maybe Dan and I, that's where we connect at times is, is Lisa had made a bid for connection, a really kind bid, uh, but, but a familiar bit in the way that somehow reminded me somehow I am not what Lisa needs at times. And in my reaction, I mean, I, I was just, I would say explosive. Like I was unkind. I said harmful and hurtful things. And, and in that very moment, I'm realizing I, it's as if I can't control what's happening, but I'm also aware of it. You know, that, that I'm, I'm triggered. I'm highly triggered. Here we go again is what a trigger is. It's here we go again. My body's reacting to, this internal but external judgment of there's something wrong with you when you can't be what the other needs. And that was my story of performance. Like when you can't do or be what the other needs in whatever way that is meant to be, then then I react in just this, I mean, I would say very, very unkind way of being with Lisa. And, and the and loudness. I can the relate loudness. to the loudness. It's hurtful. The, it's just so hurtful. It's almost like there was this cloud that said failure. Mm. You know, like he was just yeah. trying to fight his way out of this Failure, and I'm watching it. We're watching it kind of unfold. I mean, at least for me, I think I'm watching it, knowing we've been we've been through this so many times. We know the stories. We we know the triggers, and yet here we are. Like you can't. It's like mm-hmm. a flood. It's just coming. And and, you, and, and I were, and I'm. Pr- I think I was asking. I was saying, okay, let's you know. And I'm trying to recover by you know trying to use language that we can gain some understanding but it just the, the flood just was happening mm-hmm. and so um and I, but i was so unkind and they so i mean you were you're were I, I think i had my hands up at one point yeah, like, like ah. what stop almost stop and i and for three seconds or so i couldn't stop it was it was this tidal wave of intense judgment internal judgment and and now i'm projecting that and i'm i'm saying it's about her you know, I'm using words that we teach about not to use always and never, you know, simple <laughs> phrases like you always and you never. And, and again, it's, I think that's a way that most of us cope in those very moments of, I cannot bear the heartache, not only what I feel about myself, but now the harm that I've caused her in that very moment. And when, when, when did, when did the whole scenario begin to sort of stop you? Stop me. Yeah. Uh, probably three minutes later when Lisa started to tear up and she was able to name and put words to, it's so hard for me to ask for what I need. Uh, and, and I, I mean, it, I, I melted almost like I, I, my arms just went limp. I almost couldn't even drive. Like I am so sorry for using those words against you. 
I think that was the most like significant moment, not just of expression, expressing the sorrow, but being aware of that's where her story plays out in that very moment, you know, for Lisa to be able to put words to, it is so hard for me to name what I need. Uh, you know, that part of my story. And, and, it, and she wasn't saying that as a way to further shame or blame, but to say, I, I can't bear the violence against me. Um, and, and you know that this is so difficult for me to name. It was just such a tender moment, and but but sorrow, which, which is newer, because I yeah. think I think I was able to stay more present, knowing okay, I know what's happening. I know what's happening. Here's our stories. They're being, and even though this was hard and it was making me tear up, I think before I would just fight back or I would run yeah. or something. You'd go completely silent. She would, you something. would, Lisa would withdraw. Like there was no access. It was just like I'm looking out the I'm window done. and I'm not I'm turning around and. So it, there was a pre- there. Uh, there's yeah. something that stayed present, even though it was so like intense. Like if anybody could have been there, be like, "Wow!" Um, but yeah, I think I don't. I don't remember what I said, but I remember feeling like, "Okay, I'm not going under. I know what's happening. It's really hard to hear this, but I'm not going under because." Well, I think the trauma response, at least, has, has had in the past, is to run, is to flee, and I think I mean that that has been a familiar pattern, which only reinforces shame for both of us, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And so the capacity ability for her to stay present just for a little to bit, hide. I but, think to, hiding is really but also to receive, I mean, a little bit of what you were talking about, Becky, the, the, the capacity to receive. I think that that was the, I don't know how we would have navigated anything different without that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, you know, you've said it and I'll just underscore, I wish, I wish to heaven that we were not, repeating structures yeah. that create great harm against someone whom I love and would claim that I would die for. Yet in that moment, there's something in me that really would like to kill. Uh, mm. And I do. And to be caught, to be caught in the throes of that kind of tsunami. I, I just don't know how I would be able to extract myself and enter into her heartache if I didn't at least have some of these categories operating at least sometimes mm-hmm. of the intersection of, oh my gosh, we're both being triggered. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, we're both playing into the structures of reenactment of how we both have handled not just one another, but our right. worlds well before we ever met one another. Mm-hmm. And somehow in that, when I saw, as you did, Steve, the heartache that I had brought, yeah. I felt pierced. Yeah. But her, her engagement, yeah. staying in, not not shutting down, but staying in to receive my mm-hmm. grief, my sorrow, that uh, in some ways was a, a, a kind of lovemaking. Mm-hmm. It, it really is a return to an intimacy of our bodies, being able, in, in our case, standing to be able to hold each other. Mm. Uh, and again, to say, it didn't take it all away, but it was the beginning of a repair that without that, um, I, I, I just think of how many couples I've worked with, you've worked with, who have those events happening hundreds of times without any repair, yet because there really is love, they keep, in some sense, together, but the debris, the debris just mm-hmm. mounts on the shore. Mm-hmm. The tsunami just brings in so much crap mm-hmm. uh, that you do wonder mm-hmm. how it is that love can be restored. Mm-hmm. And, and I think, too, what you just said is helpful. It's it's not as if these moments won't occur. It's that when they occur. And I think sometimes we have this illusion that all is well and will always be well. But no, we, we will be triggered. Each of us will be in our marriage. I think that's true for all marriages. Mm-hmm. But the intentionality of how we repair, how we move, how we bless, how we're kind, how we receive, how we own, how we name the harm that we have caused the other. That To me, that that's so essential in the repair process and the recovery yeah. process. Yeah. 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 Just understanding the categories. And I mean, I think I was impressed when you guys were sharing that how many times you've been able to share your stories with one another, how, how many layers upon layers upon layers that, of you understanding one another's stories. And also you, you were approaching 
an event that you knew was particularly trig- triggering, right? Mm-hmm. And yet, and then here it is, you know, like if we're trying to avoid these things or if we're, we're saying, oh, we're going to give you help to, you know, so this doesn't happen in your marriage. That's not true because we have all the tools. We know we're just about to embark on something that's potentially triggering. I mean, maybe ours was more of a surprise, even though it was a really comp- re- repetitive um, event that happens often in our marriage. And yet our bodies react. Mm-hmm. We have this reenactment. And so it's about yeah. the repair. It is about the repair. And yeah, when you're in it, like, you're not thinking, you're just feeling, and you're feeling, I mean, yeah, all knowledge goes out the window without mm-hmm. realizing it. You're mm-hmm. just caught, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that it, almost the image again of, of drowning. Yes. Like at that point, uh, I'm fighting it just to get air uh, and to uh, take out a- any threat that seems like it's going to add even more harm. And so it is, I, I don't have a better word for it than there's a kind of insanity that comes in those moments. And that whole question of how, well, how do we return? Mm-hmm. You know, there are countless situations where we can fail one another. And as the scripture says, love covers a multitude of sin. This was not one of those moments where love covers it so we can just get on. Mm -hmm. There had to be a kind of return to naming the triggers, a return to naming the stories of our lives that have brought us this reenactment structure. But I think, again, I come back to this. Until you can name the log in your own eye, and that doesn't mean just naming your failure, it's naming context. Yes. It's naming the particularity of what's happening in that moment as it relates to the larger world that you know about yourself. So one of the questions that Becky asked uh, during that, that time was, did it ever help to yell at your mother? You know, the intensity and anger you brought. Did it ever seem to work? And I mean, that question was like... Beautiful question. Uh, Beautiful question. Uh, <laughs> Good for you, Becky. Mm. Uh, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> uh, let's go on. And yet, just the question itself brought images from scenes that began to sort of play out like a film role. And I, again, I don't know how other people think, but I would have like this image of of uh, of the kitchen table and an interaction with my mom or my dad. And then it would flip to another and another and another. But her patience to bless mm. the kind of rapid eye, mind, image movement and inviting me to, in one sense, hold fragmentation with someone who could actually care yeah. for that man, that boy, sharing those stories, uh, it was, I, again, I would go back to the word, that was blessing. Yes. It was not, I bless you. It was, I can hold your suffering and bring blessing to you for the courage to do so and to open the door to what it means in terms of our relationship. Mm-hmm. And I so love that question, Becky, because it's rooted in curiosity, which is so essential to repair. With, yeah. Without curiosity of the other story and what's being played out, there there is no repair. So I think that that is just a, a just so essential and beautiful way of engagement. Well, and I just give God the glory for that because you know when your body is still caught in that um, trigger and reenactment, you can't always think properly. So <laughs> I don't. I can't take ownership, but thank you. Well, it it was your words. But again, uh, I agree. There is something of the the heart of being able to say, this is what I want for my life. This is what I want for my wife and my marriage. I want her to know how blessed she is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, there was anything but blessing at the beginning. In some sense of the word, there was cursing. And I think that's... 
maybe too stark for some people to say, look, these are your two options in your marriage. In any one particular moment and over the trajectory of a year, 10 years, whatever, is are you committed to blessing one another? Or is there an incipient cursing that ultimately undermines the presence and life of the other by the, 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 the roiling contempt or at least the undercurrent of contempt? And I think that's the key that we're trying to invite our marriages to, but we're also trying to say, look, uh, we may not be that good living it out at times, but indeed, we are doing some, but we want to invite you, listener, especially for those who have some awareness of your trauma. Can we talk with you? Can we invite you into a process? Again, it's not infallible. It certainly hasn't keeping us, kept us from our own struggles, but I think it's kept us from disaster uh, and, or from just being inert and cold and hard toward one another, even in a somewhat decent marriage. So that's what we're trying to accomplish when we invite you uh, into this event, uh, May. Uh, is it May? Yes, yes May, 13, May 13, 14, 13 through 15. 15. Yes. Uh, where we're basically going, the, the calls and the islanders are going to lead both teaching, but also, shall we just say, exercises. It's it's no small groups. Uh, it's no share your story with 30 other people. Uh, it's a intimate and compelling, but also highly practical and experiential work to help you get near your triggers and to name them, mm -hmm. to begin to name and invite you to see how your reenactment structures are playing out, but also to underscore, look, we need to be real clear what it means to name the log in your own eye, because that disruptive process of owning your own failure, mm -hmm. but also how the failures came to be can really open up the potential for a different kind of a marriage, a kind yes. of sweetness, even in the midst of harm, of mm. being able to honor, to bring delight, ultimately to bless. Mm. So we're going to invite you. We'll tell you more. Uh, you can check the allendercenter.org, the allendercenter.org uh, to get more information. Uh, about this conference uh, and to know that at least the couples teaching it uh, bear some scars. Yeah, and I just <laughs> want to say, Steve, thank you for complimenting me for saying that mm -hmm. about Dan. I think sometimes I cannot, I have a hard time receiving such attunement and kindness. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I push it away sometime. Mm -hmm. And I'm aware that that was that was good that I said that. Yes, it was. Thank you for noticing. Of course. And I wanted to just say thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Of course, Becky. Yeah, you bet. Such goodness between the two of you and such a delight to have a conversation with both of you. And mm -hmm. we so look forward to the May event with you and having more conversations like this together. Yeah. And by then, by the way, COVID will be entirely resolved. That's right. Yes. There yes. will be no concerns, especially in a city <laughs> that lives underneath a mask. Mm. We'll be doing this in Seattle at a lovely, beautiful yes. uh, grounds to be able to walk, to talk. May, of course, is one of the sunniest and rain-free months. Uh, and if you know anything about Seattle, you know I'm lying. Uh, but nonetheless. <laughs> but it's not January. No, it's not January. Not January. That's for so, sure. Yes. Anything else before we end, gang? Can no. I just say, when you were ending, Dan, I think when you used the word sweetness, I I think that's so true. Like even though we shared this, you know, event that there's in the repair and and in the daily, there's a, a sweetness that we have in our marriage now after 35 years. That in the beginning, you know, the first few years when I think. I think our goal was, oh, we're going to bless each other. And we tried to bless, but there just was this, you know, that forced surface. There's a lack, surface, of, repair. There and a the lack, lack of, of awareness. Repair. There's a lack of all kinds of things, mm -hmm. but yet I really, we want to bless each other, but you, we just don't have the capacity. We didn't have the capacity, you know? And, and so now, even though, yeah, things are coming out and we have to talk about them and it just looks really messy, but there's a sweet and there's an authenticity and a sweetness that, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. is just irreplaceable and you can't get it by just trying hard, right? You have to do the work. And so I think that's the beauty. So I'm really glad that we ended with that because it is it is sweet and we do get to enjoy that on, on the daily basis. Mm-hmm. Well, it is such a pure delight to be able to do this with my beloved, but all so yes so delightful to be able to do this work with the two of you yeah and the two of you as well so yes. fun to and a privilege to be on the journey with you yeah, very much so thank you the allender center podcast is produced by the seattle school of theology and psychology if you'd like more information about the allender center you can look at the allendercenter.org